All right. Hi. Hello, everyone. Welcome today to our wonderful lecture on future work. Uh, my name is uh, Vairis, and I'll be your wonderful moderator today for this uh, for this lecture today. And I have the honor uh, to announce that uh, our speaker is uh, Diana Christian, Ernst & Young Baltics Assurance Partner. And our lecture today is on future of work. But before I give the floor to, to Diana, please everyone, I ask you to be brave and uh, ask your own questions using the Q&A section or the comment section down below. All right, and Diana, uh, may I ask you the first question before we start, what exactly is an assurance partner for those of us who are not so familiar with this title? Diana, the floor is yours. I switch on myself. Yes, you yes, see we see you and hear you. Oh, here you can see this is assurance partner. <laughs> so I don't know what, what exactly you mean by this question, but uh, uh, first of all, talking about assurance, what is assurance? Uh, in simple words, that's an audit. And assurance is including uh, simple audit, which is statutory audit, forensic audit, uh, accounting advisory. So I'm basically somebody who is uh, very skilled and working for a long, long time. And I'm working here more than 25 years. So uh, this is this is basically the person who is who is well, I'm 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 that person. So uh, and I will I will tell about uh, my experience a bit later. Uh, so let's leave uh, leave a uh, couple. Couple of uh, uh, couple of um, well, I, I will come back to that in a couple of minutes if I may. All but right. it's interesting, interesting, interesting word because uh, by being uh, a partner, you have long, long experience in this field. You are working with uh, top financial people in the uh, well economy. You are working, and uh, and uh, so it's it's very interesting to to get uh, this uh, in touch with those different people, with different entities, so with uh, different uh, businesses uh, on a daily basis, and actually also to give them advice. It's uh, it's interesting part of this. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very wonderful explanation. And uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, you may yep. you may uh, start whenever you're good. Uh, good. We can start. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good uh, day to all of you. I will switch also to the presentation and tell me if you can see. Not yet, I assume. So I can share. Do you see it? Yes, we yes, see. Yeah, do. Very good. So uh, let's start. First of all, good day to all of you. And uh, I'm very happy to send all of you greetings today in this International e Economic uh, Olympiad. And of course, I wish uh, to all of you the best results. Uh, you all have deserved it once uh, because you are already here. And uh, because uh, this uh, year International Olympic Olympiad is hosted by Latvia, I am one of Latvian speakers this week and I am presenting EY, uh, which is one of the largest uh, uh, auditing and consulting companies uh, on the globe. And uh, today I wanted to speak about future, future of work, some aspects of future uh, of work. Of course, that nobody knows what is the future, but there are some aspects which we should bear in mind and some developments in the economies uh, which uh, we should, uh, should realize there are. And based on that, we can think and we can be wise about our future and be more ready for that. And uh, what we know uh, is that I would like to cover some aspects how the economies are changing. And what that, does it mean to the new people entering the market? And what are the key skills that might be needed in the new environment? And for what we will need to touch upon, what are the mega trends driving our future economies? Because despite of COVID, there are also certain mega trends existing at this, these times, uh, which we have to bear in mind. And um, however, by listening to what I'm saying, always bear in mind that these are just predictions and directions and the realities remain to be seen and uh, might be completely different to what we predicted at this moment. And uh, but what we know for sure uh, that the speed of change we are going through is increasing with the speed of light. And that's very important to, to acknowledge. 
let me let me give you an example uh, before uh, COVID crisis in which we are already for some time in our part of the globe we were talking that it is time for a crisis we were sure that the crisis is close and is coming however nobody suspected what will trigger the crisis even more there was not a clue about this trigger which we we know uh, is there now Maybe there were guesses related to environmental aspects, maybe uh, to some other aspects, something else, but we never expected that there will be COVID, which, uh, uh, which have uh, triggered radical changes uh, to, to all our human lives, to all our economies, and uh, also in the way we interact, uh, impacting shift in demand and supply in various industries, as an example, certain transportation industry businesses has significantly gone up because we are uh, doing our purchases, uh, uh, all purchases basically remotely. The same is with IT hardware and software industries, which went up uh, significantly since, since we have uh, gone to remote, uh, remote uh, work uh, globally. And also certain uh, healthcare sectors are uh, really booming. And at the same time, we know that uh, there are many industries which basically in one day went down, which is tourism and entertainment, air transportation business and other businesses. So I know that they expected this. And this happened just, uh, just over one, one, one night, basically. And um, this cannot be predicted. This is uh, ruining our knowledge about how economies are operating and developing. And there are many, many aspects that cannot be predicted. However, there are certain mega trends existing at this moment, which we know are there, and we can analyze those mega trends and foresee their impact to, to our future. And uh, I will talk about those met mega trends in, in, in a couple of mi minutes. Let's start with EY, since I'm representing EY today as a company. I would like to tell uh, what is EY uh, in a couple of words and, um, and uh, then a little bit about myself and then uh, we will step to the uh, presentation about work of the future. Uh, EY is a very old company. Uh, if you look at the roots, uh, EY is, uh, you, you can see those roots uh, going back to the 19th century. And today I'm not so much talking about how, how old is EY, but uh, I will spend uh, a, bit, uh, a little bit of time on EY purpose because I highly evaluate myself the purpose and really believe that the purpose of company, of our company and also of any other company is very, very important and uh, is very uniting ele element with uh, clients, communities and also internally uh, among our people. And here on the next slide, you can see uh, how big EY is, and you can see that it's really a remarkable, uh, remarkable company. We are uh, uh, globally, we are more than 300,000 people. Uh, we are doing our work in 700 offices, and uh, we are uh, presented in 150 countries. It's an impressive number. Uh, speaking about our purpose, I will read a little bit about uh, about uh, purpose uh, from from my my notes, but I think it's it's uh, really worth uh, to read it out loudly. Uh, by creating by by coming to our purpose, our purpose is building a better working world, and we are proud about proud about this uh, this um, uh, this saying. The insights and quality services we provide help build trust and confidence uh, with the capital markets and in economies over the world. We develop outstanding leaders who team to deliver our, on our promises to all our stakeholders. In so doing, we play a critical role in building a better working world for our people, for our clients and for our uh, communities. We help digital pioneers fight data piracy, guide governments through cash flow crisis, unlock new medical treatments with data analytics, and pursue high quality audits to build trust in financial markets and businesses. In other words, working with entrepreneurs, companies, and entire countries to solve their most pressing challenges. Through our four integrated service lines, assurance, consulting, strategy and transactions and tax, and our deep sector knowledge, we help our clients to capitalize 
on new opportunities and assess and manage a risk to deliver responsible growth. Our high-performing multidisciplinary teams help them fulfill regulatory requirements, keep investors informed and meet stakeholder needs. And we believe a better working world is one where economic growth is sustainable and inclusive. We work continuously to improve the quality of all our services, investing in our people and investing in our innovation. And we, we are proud to work with others, from our clients to wide stakeholders, to use our knowledge, skills, and experience to help fulfill our purpose and create positive change. And I think that our purpose to create better working work is making us different, successful, and uniting all of us together. So that's shortly about EY and EY purpose, about company I'm representing today, and a little bit about myself. So as you heard, my name is Diana Christian, and I'm assurance leader, and assurance means audit, forensic, and accounting advisory services for three Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, and uh, Lithuania. And my personal experience uh, lasts already more than 25 years in this company before it was Arthur Anderson, which was merged into, uh, into, into, into Ernst & Young uh, after an Enron crisis about maybe somebody of you have heard before. And from one hand, this is long time. From the other hand, it's very short time. And by saying, uh, by saying this, I must admit that our environment is changing very, very rapidly. As an example, I can provide my experience. I'm working in this profession since very, very, very early years in this country from 1990, end of 1994. And when I started, not all of employees were having laptops. Now kids are having laptops. We didn't have laptops as employees. On the, as, uh, on, on, or uh, we, we didn't have any other computers too. So we did have some, but uh, the number of computers was limited at that time. What we were doing, we were working with pencils, sharpeners, erasers. We were documenting our work on papers. And when we did have a computer, we were uh, using Word or Excel. We were printing the work out and uh, filing in the hard, uh, hard files. And at the beginning of my career, there were no uh, mobile phones. There were faxes and fixed line phones. And uh, when first mobile phones arrived, they were really huge. I don't think that anybody of you have seen those mobile phones, but they were like big boxes. And uh, of course, that's the only function they were having that was a calling function. And that was, in my opinion, it was a very, very short time ago. And our work was consisting of huge pile of working papers. We needed separate archives to store our work, our working papers. And if we compare that time to nowadays, all is digital. We do not use pens, pencils. We do not use similar office supplies. Uh, we do not use even papers in audit. We have zero paper profile policy in our audit. So it's have changed dramatically. We are uh, continuously increasing usage of analytics in our work, which was not present at that time or little bit present at that time when I have started. And uh, especially in a COVID time, uh, in a one day, we were able to move our work remotely, uh, which basically means that we can do our work from any uh, part of the globe. Uh, and to serve our clients. And this is what is happening. Our people, all people are, uh, have been working for this more than a year, uh, have been working remotely. And the only, uh, only, only uh, important thing is to have a good connectivity, computer, and we have everything is uh, digital nowadays, comparing to, to what I told uh, at the beginning of my career. So we can see that reality is changing very rapidly, and especially uh, during the uh, last years, which means that the next coming years will have even more changes uh, coming and more rapid changes coming. Well, thinking about today, I come to a conclusion that for you, it might be interesting to look at some statistical actual data 
and we will go through slides in a minute, uh, that this data potentially is enlightening, what are some important aspects of the future in general, and what, well, you can think about your place in, in, in this future and think how you can be ready for this future. And before statistical data, let's talk a bit about it, about cornerstones or megatrends, which I have mentioned earlier, which are driving global economies, apart from COVID, which is uh, taking place now, but still we have those megatrends. And what are those megatrends? First of all, it's technology, demographics, globalization, and environment. And let's spend a couple of words on all those four megatrends, which are significantly impacting our current, current lives in the future, too. Uh, where we are now, we are now in the, on the peak of technology revolution, uh, powered by human augmentation. Uh, we have uh, lots of uh, technology, new technologies, our businesses are driven by technologies, uh, moving to new technologies, we have artificial intelligence, we have robots, we have autonomous vehicles and uh, virtual reality. And uh, more and more of this is coming. And these are unpre un unprecedented times uh, now then, because such things uh, with a such speed have never happened before. And we have to see where we are, we are uh, leading with this. To support all of this, uh, there are five technologies that will be critical in the future, which are changing and coming in the future. Uh, to uh, to support this uh, technological uh, technological changes uh, and those five are 5G mobile connectivity which is uh, coming in now, edge computing, next uh, generation batteries, uh, precision sensors, effective computing, and the technology will augment our bodies, work and home life, everything basically. But to get there, we will need an entirely new infrastructure to be in place which is coming actually very, very soon, and it, it's already here. So this is about technology. Next megatrend is a demographic megatrend. The next decade will be shaped by the maturation of Generation Z, the largest generation cohort in history comprising 1.8 billion people making up to 24% of the global population. These are all you which are, uh, which are now uh, listening to this uh, presentation, so you are coming into the market, into the workforce market. Generation change is occurring between countries, not just within them, and uh, cooperation must, uh, must understand how different life experiences shape the outlook and attitudes of the diverse generation. The maturing of Generation Z as stakeholders in society will drive decarbonization and other aspects too. So this is very important megatrend. Next one uh, is the globalization megatrend. We have grown accustomed to living in a global, globalizing world. For more than seven decades, the international economy has moved toward trade liberalization and increased cross-border flows or of labor and capital. Recent developments are shifting globalization's tectonic plates with tangible effect international trade cross-border capital flows and global supply change. Everything is changing. Global existential changes, challenges will shape many aspects. It will impact on, on global supply change, potentially will motivate multinationals to pursue near-shoring. Yet the pandemic has also led to unprecedented international cooperation. And a climate change will also demand unprecedented global cooperation and potential climate-driven uh, uh, migration. So it's a next megatrend. And the last one is environmental megatrend. I will not talk uh, much about this today, but it's also very important. And despite our technology, humanity depends on the environmental of water, air, food, and shelter. With population growth, use of polluting carbon-intensive technologies and the development of take-make-waste economy, we face a set of interconnected environmental challenges from land degradation to deforestation to water scarcity. We are entering a new phase of accelerating climate change. Volatility and disruption evidenced by six consecutive years of record global temperatures and temperatures statistically are increasing over the globe. 
Cesar, war, uh, war, uh, warming and ice melting. Uh, glaciers pose much faster than we uh, knew ever before. Accelerating sea rise. Fast growing global economic losses from weather. The pandemic illustrates the need to quickly act existential threats, mobilizing our human ability to innovate and uh, problem solve. So these are mega trends we have to recognize and, and follow how they will be impacted as in the future. Techn coming back to technology, I will talk about technologies and people and their uh, there, it is your future today. Because I believe it is the most relevant for you uh, as young people uh, entering the workforce in the future. And now let's dive to the more facts and statistics. Where are we and uh, talk about future for you? Young people who is the next generation rapidly coming into the arena and hopefully enhancing changes so much uh, needed nowadays. Today, technologies are providing access to huge volume of information. Education is available online. You can get enormous volume of knowledge, even not stepping out of your home. Knowledge is very easy accessible. You just need to take it. But even more important nowadays is how you can use and apply this knowledge. You need experiences and ability to apply the knowledge also practically, not only theoretically. At the same time, the population of the global economy is increasing very, very rapidly. And can you imagine that each day there are 150 million new babies born? It definitely gives certain pressure to various aspects, competition, consumption, ecological aspects, information volumes, and other. Population of the globe is increasing at the speed of light. And the volume of population is growing annually. These create absolutely new challenges, ecological, food production, geopolitical, and other challenges, which will drive our longer term future economies. And at the same time, if we speak about data, data volumes are increasing very rapidly too. Statistics shows that the volume of data produced annually is 3.5 zettabytes, where one zettabyte is equivalent to 250 billion DVDs, and the volume is increasing. And again, the access to the information is unlimited, and this creates another challenge, how to use and filter useful and reliable information, and what are technologies supporting this information in the future, as I have mentioned already earlier. And can you imagine that one annual information volume is equivalent to the aggregate volume through previous 5,000 years, which was periods uh, prior to such a significant information flow. So the volumes are increasing really rapidly. And it is estimated that one week's worth of the New York Times contains more information than the average 18th century person would expect to encounter in a lifetime. And information volumes are increasing with a constant increase in population of the globe. And the next, did you know that more than 4,000 books are printed every, every day? The volume is huge. The amount of technological information is doubling each two years. And now, this is very important to all of you. 50% of what college students learn in their freshman year will be outdated by third year of study. We are all in times when what is true today is not true tomorrow. So what does it mean? Does it mean that we do not study anymore? No, really not. Of course we do, but we should bear in mind and must be agile and adapt continuously. Be constantly ready for change and basically learning is a lifelong learning for all people in the future. And it is estimated 
that by 2049, the computational ability of entire human species can be performed by one single computer. So this is speed of uh, development, technological development. And for the first time in history, we have four generations and that generation also is coming into the arena. We have four generations leveraging multiple technologies simultaneously. And those generations have to adapt and learn to be able to work and cooperate together, create economies, decisions, and our future together. It is the same in EY. We have almost all these uh, generations together. And you know, what we observe that we, those who are elderly generations, have to learn how to adapt to younger generations and why because uh, we are having longer experience and we must have ability to understand this situation where we are. However, in real life, it is not as easy as I say, but of course, that we constantly learn to, to, to be agile and to, uh, to do this. And also the global nature of business has made the workspace more diverse, demanding a focus on inclusion and shared beliefs to tie people together. By 2025, Millennials will account three quarters of working people in US. It is a significant, significant shift. As a summary, we see significant upcoming change in the generation working in our economies and thus culture, belief and other changes will follow. Speaking about technology, technology is really powerful. It ensures efficiency, speed, productivity, connectivity, predictability, decision support. However, well, all, all of these are good things. However, at the same time, we also have to admit that technology is creating distractions, anxiety, isolation, overwork, distraction. So there are pluses and minuses. So we, uh, we have to really also recognize this uh, downsides and minuses and also admit them and work on those. And especially we can see that in the COVID times when we have, a bit, when we went remotely to remote work, it's not only in, in our organization, it's, uh, it's everywhere. We see that the stress levels, depressions and other mental disorders are significantly, significantly increasing by increasing remote work uh, based on technologies. So we have a speed, we have benefits, but we also have significant uh, uh, downsides in relation to this. Uh, and, and this is what we have to face and have to work with. We have uh, entered technology era, and there are many pluses and minuses uh, once we are there. On one hand, 49% of the board are active social media users, regardless of age. However, 63% of the world's population age 13 plus are active on social media. And the number is increasing uh, uh, when I speak. On the other hand, 53% of participants in a recent study said that social media sites had changed their behavior and 51% of those said that the change has been negative. We need to bear in mind all different aspects of social media, positive and also negative. On one hand, the primary source of workplace stress include things like email information, which is huge in volumes, it's, uh, it's a significant over, overload of information and the constant need to remain connected. On the other hand, nine out of 10 people sleep on arms reach to their mobile phone. Is, is, isn't this distracting? On one hand, you are stressed out. On the other hand, you do not do almost anything to feel differently because you are afraid to, sl to, slide out the, uh, to slide out of the flow. You do not want to stay behind and you want to be all, all the time connected despite of the stress you have out of it. And sometimes this is even growing into the addiction to stay connected. 
and look at kids nowadays, this is completely different generation. They all have their gadgets and wherever they go, internet connection is a key. They will do everything to get connected to, to the internet. Next statistics from one hand, six couples, six, one out of six couples married are, have met on the internet uh, through the social media. At the same time, one out of seven divorces is due to social media or due to the internet. So again, you can see it's working both, both ways. And by saying all of this, we see we are all in the internet connected. We continuously face techno stress. Techno stress is caused by constant connectivity, productivity demands, change capacity, privacy infringement, decreased human contact, loss of work. Stress related techno to technologies is rapidly increasing. Stress in the workplace is recognized as contributing to a tightening of health and quality of life issues that could have far-reaching consequences. And as mentioned earlier, earlier all of this significantly increases in emotional burnout. It's um, cause for depression and other emotional issues. And by saying all of this, the question remains, what to do with all of this and what is the next? The improvements raising from technology are easy to see. More information, efficiency, speed, purchasing opportunities, but the implications are a bit less clear. Physical and psychological well-being, personal relationships, efficiency by emotional issues. As an example, I can give our company. As I told earlier, earlier in a COVID environment, we have uh, in one night moved to remote work. From one hand, this demonstrates how effective and technology-driven we are. From the other hand, we have spent enormous efforts to motivate our people due to psychological consequences, as mentioned uh, earlier, stress, burnout, loneliness, and, and uh, other, other impacts. And one is known. Uh, in this rapidly changing environment, we are currently preparing students for the jobs that do not exist yet, using technologies that are not yet there, not invented, and in order to solve problems that we do not know yet. And tell me, how can you be ready for all of this if you don't know what is, what is your future? In other words, we all are in a transition and we all will have to change rapidly in the future. However, if we speak about you, about Generation Z, it is normal, norm for you. So this is your normal, uh, normal future, normal life. So we elderly generations will have to adapt more and change more. So you will be more used to it. When it comes to the future of work, the view on adaptability is late adapter is the same thing as out of the business. People should be constantly adapting, should be agile all, agile all the time. In today's workspace, we see constantly increasing use of digital technologies, artific artificial intelligence, technology enablements, ro robotic process automation, blockchains. All of these new trends will impact our future work. It is estimated that by 2025, smart machines will replace one out of three jobs. The World Economic Forum releases its The Future of Jobs report, a survey based on 15 economies comprising 1.9 billion workers or 65% of world's workplace workforce. The pace of technology adapting is expected to remain an abate and may accelerate in some areas. The adoption of cloud computing, big data, and e-commerce remain high priorities for business leaders, following a trend established in previous years. However, there have, has also been a significant raise in interest for encryption, 
not humanoid robots and artificial intelligence. So all of these things continuously will come into the business. Automation in tandem with the COVID-19 recession is creating a double disruption scenario for all workers. In addition to the current disruption from the pandemic induced lockdowns and economic uh, contraction, technological adoption by companies will transform tasks, jobs and skills by 2025. 43% of business surveyed indicated that they are set to reduce their workforce due to technology integration. 41% plan to expand their use of contractors for task specialized work. And 34% plan to ex expand their workforce due to technology integration. By 2025, the time spent on current tasks at work by humans and machines will be equal. A significant share of companies also expect to make changes to locations, their value change, and the size of their workforce due to factors beyond technology in the next five years. So technology will drive significant changes in businesses. The future of work has already arrived for a large majority of the online white color workplace. 84% of employees are set to rapidly digitalize working processes, including a significant expansion of remote work with the potential to move 44% of their workforce to operate remotely. And study predicts that by 2025, time spent on current tasks at work by humans and machines will be equal. As a result, Jobs that pay less than $20 per hour carry the highest risk of being replaced by automation. The simpler the task, the more risk is that it will be automated. And more than half of all project, projected jobs lost to automation will be in five sectors. So you can see those sectors on the slide. These are banking and financial services sector, travel and hospitality and leisure, technology, insurance, manufacturing sectors. So technologies are, are uh, going to significantly reduce workforce, physical workforce needs in these sectors. And at the same time, we also know that, uh, uh, we also know that there are um, jobs that, uh, that uh, will not exist in the future, at least it's uh, predicted that they will not exist or will be shrinked to say uh, much lower volumes. And you can see them on the slide. These are data, data entry gears, farm label contractors, telemarketers, real estate brokers, loan officers, insurance underwriters, cashiers, referees and sport officials, and, and uh, many, many others too. There is also a prediction what are the jobs which, uh, and, and other jobs, not only those, of course, but uh, jobs which, are, which will become popular in 2025 because demand will be increasing for those jobs. And these are professional drivers, freelance professor, uh, urban farmers, smart home hand persons, senior caregivers, 3D printer, uh, design specialist, virtual reality experience designers, and of course, at some others too. So what's next again? Work is becoming increasingly automated. This is what I observe at companies and I observe this is happening in our company too. And this is our future, unavoidable future. Beneficially, technology takes the robot to automate routine tasks, but it also implies that we need, and it requires to be nimble and trained for the next wave of jobs. And we need to utilize the work in a new way. So we will have workforce, but we will have to transform this workforce into the new, uh, new realities. This doesn't just reduce jobs automation, uh, it frees up people, workforce to expand how we utilize the workers in the future. And here is a question. Is there still plenty of opportunity or is it a norm for Generation Z? 
it is new norm and new opportunities. The question is how to get us ready for these new changes. Global workforces are changing. As it was told by Friedman, who is American politi political commentator, in globalization stage one, starting from 1492, the word shifted from large to medium. In stage two of globalization, the globe went, it shifted from multinational companies, uh, uh, it shifted from multinational companies to the small. And if we speak about third globalization stage, then the word shifted from, so first it was from medium to small size, and then it shifted from small to tiny. So basically globe, in sense of economy, it's, it's very tiny and, and it's very global at the moment. Let's look at this map. The map demonstrates certain areas, not all global, but certain areas. You can see in red uh, the workforce. It's going to be in a deficit in the future. The um, yellow one is uh, we expect moderate increase in workforces. And in green, we can see significant increases in a workforce. So we can see that uh, the this is demographic challenge. Somewhere we will have excess of, of a workforce, somewhere we'll, we will have a deficit of a workforce. And of, of course, uh, we will have to see how we can shift, how we can uh, utilize this workforce across the globe appropriately. As an example, you can give, all, I can give you also my company. We have uh, hubs, so-called um, centers, uh, which are uh, supporting EY operations globally. For instance, one of the largest centers we have is in India. So we can say that's uh, in, a, uh, in a green color. So basically people from India can, uh, can do audits, uh, for instance, in Latvia or support audits in Latvia. And this is what is happening in the future, because we also can see in a COVID environment that borders are uh, losing its, uh, their, its importance. Of course, it, uh, they remain language challenge, but it's uh, basically becoming one of, the, one of the key challenges, but it also can be overcome because English language, business language is very widely used nowadays. At the same time, uh, we also have to admit that 850 million people across seven countries, you can see these seven countries here, are economically underutilized, accounting for 30 to 50% of work age population. This is also going to be changed in the futures and, and people have to be retrained and, and to be, uh, so that we can be able to use them in the future. And millennials nowadays make up about 35% of US workforce. So new generation is coming into the workforce. There are also statistics that from 2013 to 2020, 11 million entered US workforce. These aren't just additional millennials coming to, into the workforce or that people. Those are employees who were not previously employed as a workforce. Mostly they are women and students. But even with these additional workers, millennials and Generation Z share of the workforce is only expected to grow about 44% by 2025. As a percentage of private sector union member declines, so basically long-term employed people number declines, the number of temporary workers is significantly uh, increasing. So this is a new trend, uh, temporary worker trend, temporary employment trend. In the next slide, you, you can see that uh, uh, on a US example, We can see that in 2020, the US had the lowest percentage of temporary workers among leading global economies. And this is estimated to change dramatically in the nearest future. 
And there are also some statistics uh, in U related to US and as the US Department of Labor estimates that today learner, that's basically you, will have 10 to 14 jobs by age of 38. This was absolutely not imaginable just a short time ago. Statistics also show that one out of four employees has been with the same employer less than one year and one out of two less than five years. And so again, a question, what is next? If to summarize all of this, where we are, global workforce is changing. Number of underemployment is changing. Number of millennials, millennials is increasing. Increased participation from women and students into the uh, labor market. Growth related to India and, and Africa. Global overall birth rates are increasing. So thus, these are all challenges which will drive our future economies. Beneficially, technology allows for to be performed virtually without presence in the country, as I told earlier. And there, I can provide you with many examples what I can observe at the companies nowadays. And this implies that workers and talent can be found and utilized in a rapid fashion, no matter of the, uh, in relation to the location. Anytime, anywhere. This new dynamic is creating an entirely new economic reality for the workforce of the future. The new economics of work and working, the truth in lifetime job is, uh, the, the lifetime job is a history. This is not true anymore. So you saw that younger generation is, have, have, uh, is going to have multiple, multiple uh, jobs through their careers. The careers will be patchwork of various assignments with help of apps and various platforms. And already today, well, these are uh, US examples, but already today there are many new emerged companies in various countries. Young professionals can use their apps and phones to clean up their home by using Handy, get their groceries by uh, bought and delivered by Instacart, get their clothes washed used by Vashio, get their flowers by using Bloom that getting personal assistant by using fancy hands, get an errand done by using task rabbits, get presents wrapped and delivered by using ship, get the restaurant quality food delivered in 10 minutes by using sprig. There are the, com uh, the, there are the companies employing contingent workers and these are these companies which are uh, employing contingent workers. And this contingent labor is shifting the balance of wealth, reducing labor costs, increasing government interventions, and contingent labor is dramatically changing the reward systems with lack of retirement, lack of time off, lack of insurance benefits. So this is these are new realities. The contingent labor professional will move to periods of wealth accumulation and wealth depletion with no sense of retirement. That's a prediction at the moment. Contingent professional will compete for the lowest price of assignment. This graph shows that the projected financial assets of all generations through 2030 puts millennials behind. So you can see that the uh, bells of millennials will, uh, will stay behind. And because of the above, millennials and next generation will not be intended by what they own by the 30 year career with one employer. They will be identified by the purpose. From 200,000 job seekers survey, top four preferences were as follows, and none of them were related to the wealth or, or monetary. 
having good relationship, relationships with their colleagues, having a good work-life balance, having a good relationships with their boss, attractive good salary came only in eighth place. When interviewed, five out of six executives, which is 84% believe an organization that has shaped shared purpose will be more successful in transformation efforts. So we know that we will, have, we will all have to transform. So we need our purpose to be more successful in that. So what's next? So contingent labor is changing the economics of work, the way we work, the way we live and the way we retire, the way we employ, the way we distribute wealth the way we define retirement, the way we enter and leave employment. As a result, millennials in Generation Z are changing their consumption patterns. Does purpose matter more than a money? By this, we can conclude that it is important putting the human back into human capital. However, there is built-in conflict into that. Ironically, as technology is making human connectivity ever more important, the platforms and data we connect to disconnect us from it, to disconnect basically us from each other, and this is a conflicting aspect. Getting back to human, we need to find a way to cope with the stress and re-engage our human creativity. The question remains how we can achieve this? And the answer is by achieving mind clarity, creating wholesale work environments, increasing the need for strong social skills, helping employees to adapt to the change. And how? So speak about achieving mind clarity, how? By thinking clearly and making effective decisions, being more creative, innovative, and collaborative, building resilience to bounce back from stress. Speak about creating healthier work environments, how? By decreasing stress hormones, improving cognitive focus, creativity and productivity, improving social, rela uh, social relationships, teaming, and then speak about increasing the need for strong social skills. Again, the question is how? by stepping away from the computer and increasing social, uh, socially, collaborating and playing of team member strengths, adapting to changing circumstances, helping employees adapt to the change. Again, the question is how? By retaining employees who, whose time is fed, fed up due to technology, leveraging must and online open courses, encouraging sabbaticals and cross-company talent exchanges. And I like this quote. From a leader's perspective, I don't think the challenge is an intellectual one of knowing which disruption is coming. The challenge is how you get the organization to embrace the looming change. That is the most important. What does it mean to lead in a digital age? What if CEO stood for chief enabling officer, but if that CEO's primary role were to nurture a breed of entrepreneurs who would grow into tomorrow's entrepreneurs. And now to the most important, what are the new workforce competencies to succeed? So what's important for you, for young people, what are these competencies? And here they are, technology and data aptitude, collaboration and networking, virtual team working, conceptual analytical skills, process analysis skills, vendor service provider co collaboration, diversity mindset, continuous self-directed learning, flexibility, adaptability. I would say lots of those are uh, soft skills. Of course, technical skills always have to be there, but lots of those are soft skills. And uh, you, well, we also, and you young people, you have to be agile all the time and to have 
be to, to be able to adapt and to cope with the stress that we are having nowadays and be conscious and and uh, learn how to work in this environment and this is not only about employees of course also employers have to be uh, have to be wise and have to be adapting and there are uh, very very important mindsets which have to be in place and this is uh, intellectual curiosity, 360 thinking, adaptability, empathy, alignment, inspiration, cultural curiosity, collaboration, integration, and connectivity. So this is both mutual uh, way, may, way of working. There, uh, there is need for new skills for new people coming in. But at the same time, leaders have to be wise and have to adapt in these new circumstances. And this is. Um, how can, how can we all help transforming uh, our future? And it is by energy, by entrepreneurship, empathy, execution, engagement, uh, energizing others and yeah, being engaged. That's a significant part of transformation in these interesting times. And a conclusion, we all are on this incredible journey a new journey, how we work, how we serve our clients, how can leaders manage, communicate, inspire, and succeed in global digital economy. Be prepared and be wise about it. Be agile, learn new skills and competencies, and be ready to adapt at all times. These new dynamics is creating an entirely new economic reality for the workforce, so for all of us, for all generations together, especially in the COVID environment. As we can see in a new rapidly changing environment, it is given that people will need to change constantly, to be agile constantly. However, this is exactly the key challenge because uh, psychological uh, research shows that people do not like changes, so they would they, they are really resistant to it. So this is a key challenge, how to change ourselves while knowing that we don't like these changes. And by this, I would like to say to all of you, thank you. I would like to wish you a successful journey in this new challenging environment and uh, good luck uh, in the future and good luck in the Olympia. And maybe you have any, any questions. Thank you, thank you for, for your lecture. Uh, I see currently there are no questions from the attendees, but you still have some time as uh, I have some questions, if, if I may ask. Awesome. So, um, and actually, uh, while you were uh, saying that the, the lifetime job is a history, and I'm sure it, it will go that way, quite ironically, my, my family member texted me that it's her 35th uh, your anniversary at her one and only workplace. But uh, continuing with questions, uh, I heard that a lot, lot of these uh, lowly paid jobs will be lost to automation and, and so on and so forth. So my question to you is, um, how, how exactly would the, the Gen Z and all the new workers get that first job experience, the entry jobs, as they are usually the ones uh, who, who get paid less, right? Um, and it seems there'll be higher demand for these higher professionals, but uh, where would the entry level jobs be then? Uh, how, how would we get the experience that the, the new gener generation if, if these lowly paid jobs are, are uh, going, gonna go away? Well, first of all, it will not uh, happen overnight, and that's one thing. And uh, I, well, it's a, it's a very complicated question, actually. But uh, well, because I would be more ready to answer what to, what to do, kind of when you have this experience, because the, the jobs will not disappear uh, in general. So the uh, lower paid jobs will disappear. However, at the same time, uh, we will have a, a workforce is not disappearing and we will have uh, uh, we will have uh, jobs which are requiring as I told these new skills uh, speak more technical skills more analytical skills and so on and so on 
And of course, that uh, this uh, uh, today uh, young people are getting uh, their skills through lower, well, as you say, lower paid jobs because they, they are STEAM players. You are getting experience, and then, then you are moving on. I wouldn't say that they will disappear completely. So they will be still uh, these jobs which we did have in the market, and at the same time they are new, but these will not be like permanent long-time jobs, but will be contract or uh, contract jobs. They, these are not disappearing. Of course, it might be uh, challenging uh, to, and, and, and it will be different uh, to get up uh, with the same speed uh, as you were using to get up because some of those jobs will be to, to done by automation. But I would say that they still will not disappear, so they will be different. And I would say that most probably uh, it is very, um, I have mentioned, maybe not, I have mentioned it, education part. So I think that education, and it's not I think, but uh, it is uh, inevitable that education also will have to change. And maybe some of those things which you were uh, learning at the job will have to shift to the educational part. So it will be a shift and it's it's very difficult to say how exactly it will shift as I thought at the very beginning. So we predict that there will be changes, but how, and and of course for young people, it, it will be more, more complex. From the other hand, I would say that borders are also, as I thought, opening. So there are no borders or, or borders to, to, the, to, to the lesser extent. And, uh, and uh, by saying that, uh, it means that from Latvia, you, you can work to India or vice versa, or, or we have like people who are working from Belarus to, to Latvia or from the countryside to, to Riga. So different people will be in the market market and, and uh, well, it's, it's a complicated question, no answer to that, but nothing will disappear in one day. Education will have to step it, it, into that uh, differently, I would say, in a different quality. And there will be new, uh, new uh, jobs uh, and you will have a different education. All right, uh, thank you. Yes, it's certainly complicated uh, question and task to, to predict future. So, so, so I understand. That. But jobs will not disappear. You <laughs> just have to be ready Good to, to hear. different jobs. Yeah. All right, we have also two questions from uh, Hamidi from Malaysia. So, first of them being, what are some of the law and uh, and regulations, laws and regulations, that need to be changed? changed to cope with this future of work. So for example, law on minimum wage or employee protection. So, so what are these laws and regulations that uh, could be or should be changed in, in your view? Uh, can you maybe elaborate in respect of what? Uh, for example, on, on minimum wage or employee protection, should, should there be any Changes. Yeah, that, that is, uh, well, uh, so there so definitely will be changes uh, needed because, uh, uh, and, and not because, but uh, as, as, as we know, the future will change and then the governments definitely will have to, uh, in specific situation, if necessary, to, uh, to interact with that. And that's what was on one of uh, my slides in the presentation. How, we don't know yet, it depends. So if there is, there are uh, specific uh, tools, uh, how governments can impact uh, employment, uh, unemployment, uh, and, and in different countries, those tools are different. Yeah? So there is no universal answer to that, but that's, that's basically, a duty of the government, and, and we still are speaking about specific countries because uh, borders in, in uh, geopolitical sense, they are not disappearing, uh, but uh, definitely we will, we will see uh, changes once they will be needed, if needed. And they are happening all the time. It's right. not overnight. Yeah, uh, actually, even with COVID, it's not maybe so much uh, related to the employment. However, even with employment, we can see that each country have made uh, immediately changes in the legislation once it's necessary due to employment, due to support, due to taxation, uh, due to many, many aspects. And this is the same. Once the situation comes, 
uh, that's the task of the government once we have these borders and they should react. And of course, that they will react uh, differently depending on the situation. Yes, all right, thank you. Um, the next question, do you think that the future of work will create even more inequality? And as an example, uh, places, for example, with lack of internet connection uh, might be far behind in this globalized world, or it will be the other way around. So e-commerce could reduce poverty and, and give these uh, maybe new areas of the world uh, better, better chances to compete in the global world. Uh, if to speak about my view, uh, if to speak about workforce and opportunities, then connectivity, I think it is very important. And this is, as I told at the very beginning, this is one of the uh, mega trends. So the new technologies will come into place. And uh, this is uh, looking from the current point of view, this is a cornerstone of success in the future. So if I look at uh, our organization, as I told that overnight, we started to work remotely. And this is because we have uh, connectivity and, and well, that's, that's basically success. Of course, I do not want to say that uh, the uh, geographies where connectivity is not as good uh, uh, will not exist, they will exist, but uh, the uh, quality of jobs, uh, of course, it will be different. If we speak about opportunities related to, the, uh, to these geographies in relation to uh, um, uh, technology uh, opportunity to uh, to to invest into technologies in these areas. Of course, that's a narrow uh, narrow kind of um, area where uh, certain uh, businesses can gain by by improving connectivity. That's for sure. But that's that's a different uh, different uh, aspect. But if we speak about employment, I would say that this is. At this looking from the now uh, today's point of view, it is very important that there is connectivity because uh, work is more and more. Uh, we, we can work remotely. We can do many things remotely. We can do remotely things in a in a consulting. Uh, banks are working remotely uh, from the day one. Banks were serving uh, clients. Were able to serve clients remotely. And even with the old um, COVID uh, digipass, everything is is digital. So uh, you have you you most probably will have more issues, and you can kind of lay behind if, if you are out of this uh, stream. All right, and and do you think uh, so? It's gonna shift the inequality to to the world to more in, unequal or or more equal. In, in the net, uh, net, that uh, can be inequality, uh, but uh, uh, remain to be seen. Remain to uh, be seen how the uh, technology shift will take place. As I told, there uh, there is a need to. And, and there will be new technologies in the future. And the question is how fast and whether in all geographies that will take place. Of course, that there can be inequality if some geographies or some countries uh, leave behind. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so uh, I also had another question. Uh, what's the future, the role of the, the office, of physical office space, considering that, uh, well, how I, I might see it or might be the companies might see it, uh, there's a chance to outsource the office to the employee's home? That's, it's a very interesting question, and I think that there is no right or wrong answer, because uh, even from looking from our organization point of view, it all depends. And it definitely will be to a certain extent uh, different whether that will be triggered by the COVID situation or something else we will see. But uh, what we are discussing now in our organization, and I know that in other organizations too, uh, what uh, is the uh, future of work in terms of remote or physical? And there is no golden answer. It depends on a business, of course. But what we see from our surveys in our organization that there are people uh, who are happy to work remotely, and they would be happy to work as much as they can remotely. And there are people who are uh, missing physical work, who are looking for physical work at the office or at the client, depending on the industry, of course. 
And the truth, in my view, the truth is somewhere in the middle, because if you, what we can see that by remote work, as I have, uh, there was in one slide, uh, the downside of remote work. Uh, somehow, especially younger generation people, they are get, getting very stressed. They are having depressions and, and, and many other uh, consequences out of remote work. And I'm not a doctor. I can't comment why exactly there are specialists which are dealing with these type of questions. And we have really, as, as our organization, and I know also other organizations, uh, we have uh, done a lot of efforts to, to motivate our people because we still were working basically 100% remotely. So the truth is, I think somewhere in the middle, people need physical human interaction. That's uh, unavoidable. So full outsourcing to home offices for the moment, I don't say that it's the best future. However, uh, some, some proportion, uh, 50, 50, 40, 60, whatever, that in my view is the future. Because there is, uh, in, a, in a remote work, there is also motivational part, uh, because you can see, you can be closer to your family, you can save time while you are driving to the office. Uh, in, in Latvia, it's very easy to get to the work, but in some countries, it takes several hours, and it's very, very time-consuming, and it's uh, basically eating up your uh, your life in, in a way. Yeah? So the truth is somewhere in the middle remains to be seen, because we are not yet back. So we will see how many COVID waves we will have uh, in, 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 in different countries, it will be different, but physical interaction, it's very important for people. All right, thank you. Yeah, I, I guess I'm also somewhere in the middle on, on, on this question, and I think the organ my personal opinion would be that organizations should also be as flexible uh, as their workers. So uh, it, yeah, yeah, it we, will be. we will be, mm -hmm. sure. And uh, if, if I may ask, last question for, from me, if any attendees still have something, so your last chance to write it. Uh, but for me, you also mentioned how in the beginning of your career, you, you had these physical uh, document archives and, and how the system was much different. So my question might be more specific about electronic document management systems, which I'm sure is very important aspect in your field of work. And of course, there are legal requirements which require you to have documents, but um, well, what's the future of of documentation and and data recording this recording in this sense? Considering how much work is done through instant messaging programs and and even email sometimes, which is not usually that easily convertible into the traditional data recording uh, systems, I, I might say. And, and this is a topical issue, actually, sometimes at, at my workplace as, as well. And, and where, where, where's the right balance for organizations as well? How should they tackle it? Well, actually, here, I think that we are in the future, and I don't think that uh, in our profession it will be much different, because uh, in our profession, uh, and actually, if we speak about... Um, similar consulta consulting professions or about finances, uh, we need to uh, be able to, uh, to have certain proof, evidence of documentation, so it will not disappear. It's all about evidence. And uh, well, we have, as I told, we have moved, moved fully to digital and for, well, for different business streams here, we have different programs. And uh, well, I will speak uh, as an example in relation to audit, we have our canvas, which is a uh, digital tool, where, uh, which uh, it's not only storage, it's a tool. So we are uh, using this as a tool uh, to do our audits and also we are storing there our evidence and it can be stored in directly into the tool. It can be attached to Zemas, it can be uh, Excel, Word, uh, uh, PDF. So everything can be, can be and, and, and the extracts from the client systems, client data, everything is going into the tool. And that's the only place we are storing it, because as, as, uh, as you uh, correctly have pointed out, then uh, well, we, we, 
we, we cannot leave things in emails or, or, or somewhere on the network uh, to be deleted and so on. So basically these are tools like, uh, like, uh, like a program for any entity where you are storing your accounting data. We also have our tools and we have uh, clouds. Uh, and of course, it's, uh, there is uh, a very strong security uh, systems, how we are safeguarding our clouds. And it's, it's not in Latvia, it's, it's uh, in, in di different uh, geographical regions, uh, regions in different places. So we are storing our data and it's secure. It's in one place uh, for each, uh, each project. It's a separate, uh, separate tool. And, and, and of course, that we make sure that we are complying with uh, legislative requirements. And there are certain requirements for how many years we should store this uh, documentation. It's a similar with accounting. So it's uh, uh, more and more uh, clouds, uh, clouds, uh, clouds are, are uh, used uh, to save the data. But it's all digital, all everything. So if we have an email, we copy the email into the into the document. It can be copied into Word. It can be uh, attached. It can be it can be uh, used in different formats. If we use an email, of course, email not always is an evidence. Yeah. Yeah, and, and exactly that's that was one of the I guess I don't want to say issues, but but still uh, it still requires some manual work, and I'm sure there are some ways to automate, right? Even yeah. to copy it, but uh, but still it's it's I'm, I'm sure maybe that's an answer works. to your first question. So there's still need for manual some manual work, but the volume of manual work is decreasing rapidly. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah? And uh, so if, uh, and, and actually in our work, uh, we need less and less uh, manual work. We need some simplified works, but I think that with the years, what we see, it will be diminishing and diminishing because we have new tools. So instead of people analyzing data, like uh, they still will analyze data, but uh, uh, if historically people were uh, compiling and analyzing data uh, manually and then in Excel, then nowadays there are tools who are, which these tools are extracting data directly from the systems. Uh, if you sort them properly, this is manual part of the work. So you sort them properly and then you push the button and then they give an outcome. <laughs> so that's so there's still some manual work and uh, some manual work there, there will be, but the uh, quality of manual work is the, the knowledge required for manual work is at the higher level comparing to what it used to be earlier like before and it will change in the future, I think, more and more. All right. Well, uh, th thank you for, for answering all, all these questions and for your lecture. And uh, I see we have no no other questions. So if, if you have any last words, feel feel free to to to, to say them. But other than that, I, I guess that's a goodbye from me. Yeah, I think that I have told my last words already. So I have good luck. I have good. I I, I would like to wish good results, good uh, jobs for all of you who are not yet employed, and the future is uh, belonging to you. And we are here to coach you, but uh, you are the ones who will, who will uh, drive the future. <laughs> all right, all right. Then, then le let's see what the future brings. Thank you again. Thank you. And uh, goodbye, bye. goodbye. Goodbye.